attended public education, and I also graduated from Kalani High School, the Eighth Falcon. <laughs> um, I wanted, before we begin, I want to uh, recognize the other Parents for Public School members in the audience. So there are 750 of us across the state. Um, if you're a Parents for Public School member currently, could you wave your hand so people see who you are? Okay, great, and we're looking for others. So please consider becoming a member. It doesn't cost anything. Um, Parents for Public Schools of Hawaii is a six-year-old organization. Um, and as I said, we're a statewide, so we're um, you know trying to reach out as much as we can, but we're mostly volunteers. So um, today's uh, presentation is on um, supporting family engagement and, <clears throat> and in school regarding practices and policies. What we're hoping to cover today is to kind of go over what um, who we are how we came to be, um, some of our um, activities to date, and then our reaction. We were asked to give a reaction to the governor's blueprint for education and also to the DOE strategic plan. Then we're hoping we have questions, and so we're trying to um, keep on time. We have a timekeeper um, so that you can ask your questions and provide comments to us. So some of you may re remember 2009, um, the furlough Friday crisis, and this is our um, humble beginnings. Many of us met at these protests as parents of children who were furloughed on Friday, and um, we met um, out and picketing, and then we, many of us met in the governor's office. So there we were in 2009, and we were really um, shocked that when we realized that the family voice, the voice of the people for whom education is supposed to be serving, was not being heard and was not was being left out of um, the conversation regarding public decision, public decisions regarding public education. So we, um, after that crisis was somewhat resolved for the children at least, um, we decided that we would stay together. Previously, we were called Save Our Schools Hawaii, SOS, so you might remember us in the news. Um, and then we decided to be more legitimate and to um, organize as a nonprofit organization. So we looked around and we saw that um, there was a national organization that could meet our needs. Um, the National Parents for Public Schools is a 26-year-old organization with 17 chapters in 13 states. And we're um, the only chapter that is statewide because they, um, the chapters are organized by district. And the organization, the national organization, focuses on mobilizing educating and, 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 and engaging families of, of public school students. So we felt this grassroots organization that really lets us do whatever we want and also is very supportive in their resources and uh, support um, was a good way to, to continue. So we became, we applied for and, we were, and was, were accepted as the Hawaii State um, chapter of Parents for Public Schools. And here you can see our mission, which involves engaging parents, students, and community members um, across the state in supporting um, public education. And we do this through effective communication between families, community members, and schools, greater awareness of educational policies and practices, community involvement in education and decision making. So that was the part that we felt was lacking in the furlough Friday decision. And then also accurate media representation of public education. We felt that um, public schools often are represented as just negative in the media. So now I'm gonna um, turn the, over the mic to some of my colleagues in Parents for Public Schools to discuss how we meet the mission um, through our various activities. And each person will just introduce themselves, thanks. 
Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Claire Hannes. I am a board member of Parents for Public Schools, a former member of Save Our Schools Hawaii, and I have two kids in the public school system, a sophomore at Kaiser and an eighth grader at New Valley. Um, the Parent Ambassador Program was designed really to uh, provide an opportunity for um, parents, and when we say parents, I know the organization is called Parents for Public Schools, but it's not in any way limited to parents. I was just talking to a couple of college eds, um, uh, women at our table, uh, future teachers. I mean, anyone who cares about public education, we invite you to become a, a member or involved in any way um, with Parents for Public Schools. It's kind of, the name sounds a little bit more limited than we actually are. Um, but the ambassador program is a way for us to uh, get the word out statewide um, for what Parents for Public Schools does. It's kind of school by school. And it's also an opportunity for individuals to become more involved with the organization, but maybe who, who can't be board members for different reasons, or maybe you know live on a neighbor <coughs> island and aren't able to, to come into meetings, although we do what we can to try to um, make meetings accessible and, and remote uh, and, uh, and meet the challenges of, of our, our island geography. So um, we have currently ambassadors uh, at schools on uh, Hawaii Island, Maui, and Oahu. Um, we're looking to expand um, to, and, and try to get ambassadors in as many schools as possible, um, both to um, serve as a, a, a voice for PPS at the individual schools, but also to take information from those individual schools and feed it back to Parents for Public Schools so that we know what some of the the challenges and successes are um, statewide, and we have a, a huge area to cover, and we feel that this is the most effective way of doing it. It's a relatively new program, um, and if there can be more than one ambassador per school, for sure. Of course, the thing with schools is you have you know children graduating and moving on, and so we're we're constantly looking to um, you know replenish the pool and expand. So. Uh, we have a fabulous website, thanks in part to Katie, one of our board members. Really, really there are, are cards on the table. I encourage you to, to spend a few minutes at the website, read more about us. Really, uh, please join as a member. We really need to increase our numbers. Um, again, there's, there's no charge, and, and carry our little cards around with you. That's something that we ask ambassadors to do, and if you meet uh, people who have some investment in the public school system whatsoever, hand out a card and, and ask them to learn more about the organization. We feel like the only way we're really going to be effective in uh, changing the problems that face Hawaii's public schools is to really build a, a mass movement of parents and community members. And right now, we're the only organization that's really trying to do that. Thank you. Substituting for Jeanette Macaluso today, um, but um, we, uh, we're really excited about just sharing a little bit about how our organization first really got some grassroots involvement in our community schools. So we started off thinking that you know how do how do we engage families in that dialogue and and keep families feeling as if they can still have a role to support their students as their kids as they're moving up along the grades. So we really thought that middle school was a time where families seemed to feel a struggle. How do I keep supporting and stay engaged with my kid and also support the fact that they're becoming adolescents and that they're needing to get some autonomy and then they're <coughs> pushing this away and saying, it's okay, mom and dad, I got this, I don't need you. So we thought that um, looking at the transition to middle school would be a really crucial time not only for parents in their shifting roles, but also for what schools are asking students to do. And sometimes it's a scary time for families as they're looking at their kids growing up. They have a hard time imagining their little kids suddenly going to middle school. So we started offering <coughs> tours of schools in the Honolulu area, and this was really a very beginning part of our organization's efforts. And we um, partnered with multiple schools in Honolulu district to offer school tools during the day. And this is kind of a kind of a different approach. So families could actually go, um, we worked with the schools and they provided 
um, the principal would do some information. Sometimes some of the other school staff would talk about their programs. They'd talk about homework policies. They would talk about grading. They would talk about school opportunities for kids for after school time. And families really felt welcomed. Very few families have that opportunity to sit in a smaller group and have those discussions and have a real tour of the school and see what was actually happening on campus. So we've expanded those school tours to uh, other districts on Oahu and also to some neighbor islands. And so we're really excited about that. For families who weren't able to come um, to school tours, we decided to start offering transition nights. And we do a deeper dive into what does the transition look like to middle school? We have an adolescent, thank you. We have um, an adolescent development night where we talk about changes in the brain and learning. Um, Lois, who's a professor at the University of Hawaii and her, her other day, daytime job, um, and some of our other, our other folks really provide an in-depth look at what is happening, why is middle school different from elementary school, how are kids progressing, we talk about the psychosocial changes as well as learning changes, and really invite parents to spend some time getting to know what's happening at the school and why middle schools are special. So um, our next area I'm gonna talk about is our parent engagement program. You see we have this lovely banner here. Um, we thought that we wanted to go beyond a one-time event on involving families. And we looked around for what are some other parent engagement um, curriculums that are out there. And our national organization had actually spent a lot of time really researching um, and coming up with a curriculum that we <coughs> felt was really that in-depth parent leadership, parent, um, parent overview of what are school systems and what is really happening. How do we give our... I did the first session, it was one hour. Uh, and actually, Kauai had a huge educational summit, about 500 people. And so I did the session three times, actually. I had to do it three times. So the first time I did it, um, and actually Steve in the front here actually was my first editor. He saw what I was going to do. We changed it up. And then I did this first session talk. And at the end of it, my room monitor, a young lady, she's a senior at Kauai High School, her name is Brianne. So just before we're gonna start the second session, oops. Jess, drop the water all over my uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I'll give you my show. No, 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 no. You sure? Oh, wow. We don't have to take that. Okay. It's good. Okay. I'll just use it as my... Thank you for all that help. I really appreciate it. No okay, so anyway, so getting back to start. So I asked, we had five minutes before I was supposed to start the second session. So Brianne, what did you, like, give me some feedback, because i got to go back up there and we got to do this again. She goes, can I be honest? I was like, oh, okay. She said, you know, the front part was a little bit confusing, and at the end, it got, like, I kind of got what, what the talk was about. And so I was like, okay, because... Yesterday was all about how does design thinking fit into education? Like how is it being used? So I took everything and redid it. So you're getting the kind of second or third variation of this presentation, okay? So design thinking. So how many people have actually done any kind of design thinking or have been having kind of training in design thinking? Okay, a few of you. So the rest of you know nothing about design thinking. And and you guys came to this talk. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, great. You know, by the way, I looked at the uh, thing in the, the the, um, in the guide, I, I didn't get a promotion. I'm not the CEO of Ocean Head, by the way. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, but I want to thank you for coming. Um, so design thinking is basically these five steps. Empathy defined, ideate and prototype. It is, uh, in my opinion, it, everybody, has, everybody does design thinking. Everybody does design thinking. You've done it before. You may not have called it out in these five steps, but you've done it, um, these steps. And a little interesting tidbit, young people, from what I've seen, spend a lot of their time on the front two parts, <clears throat> the first two steps, empathy defined, because they live, they're trying to understand, they're, they're, you know kids, they're always asking why, 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 why? The first two steps in design thinking is all about that. Who are you and why, why, why? Why do you do what you do? And as adults, as time goes on, we spend more time from this third steps, ideation, prototyping, and testing. We spend less and less time in the front end because when you have 30 years of experience and you've been doing this a lot, you kind of start assuming a lot of things.
things. The kids spend a lot of time on the front end. But that's where the magic, I believe, in innovation and empowerment and curiosity, like that's how you bring that piece back. And this is a tool for us as adults to remain young, to think young. <clears throat> now, big companies live in the, in the latter half of this process. Startups that are disrupting the entire world, guess where they live? They live on the front end of this. <clears throat> so just to kind of give you a sense, but these five steps, though they look linear, is an iterative process. So when Tony is talking about fail fast, fail forward, this is the methodology that Silicon Valley and all the best innovative companies in the world are using. This is the process. If you Google design thinking, you will come upon articles and articles and articles, tons and tons of materials, research studies that are starting to begin about the use of design thinking for innovation and creativity. Okay? And we'll make all these materials available as well to you guys. <clears throat> So I'm just gonna take you through what are the five steps first. Okay, so in design thinking, the first step is empathy. And these are ways to do empathy, but this is where I believe innovation begins. It be begins in empathy. And that means kind of taking off your shoes and slipping yours, you know, so that you can kind of walk in your, your, your users' and users' shoes. So if you're an educator, in my opinion, your end users, you have various end users, but your main end users is your students and their families <clears throat> and the communities they live in. But these are different ways to do empathy work. You can do observational work. You could, as a teacher, <clears throat> working with your students as a team, observe how students interact in other classrooms. Just observing, or how a school functions and what to do. You can do observational studies. You can do immersive studies where you, as a teacher, become a student again. You get down on, all, on, on your knees and you see the world at that height in your classroom. You get to see what it's like to be a student. You sit in their chairs, you work at their desk. Immerse yourself. The other one is engagement. So these are like interviews <clears throat> that you would do with users. And in empathy, we tend to focus on interviewing extreme users. And I'm gonna show you a video in just a second where we worked with extreme users. And these extreme users are what I call the high potential kids. These are high potential kids. Okay. So first step is empathy. Second step is define, and in define, you're asking yourself, who am I designing for? You're always asking this question, who am I designing for? And you're trying to figure out who's the user, what is the need, and what are some insights in the process, okay? So, so you're spending, and it's, and it's not like marketing where you're trying to create this like, I'm, my user is a male, 24 to 27, blah, 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 blah. That's not how we do design thinking. In fact, I'm from, my whole background is in business and marketing. That's like a bad way to innovate. Because now you're creating this composite user. To really create innovation, you have to design for a very specific user. Literally, if you cannot give me the name of the user you're designing for, I'm telling you, you're, you're kind of going maybe in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Design for a specific user, an extreme user. Because extreme users tend to amplify the need that you cannot see in the general population. Okay. Third step is ideation. So this is where a lot of us spend time here. It's like, go crazy, create a lot of ideas. But I tell you right now, kids are 10 times better than us as adults because already what happens is our skills, experiences, and education actually prevent us from doing this very, this very well. This is an, another skill. Those two, everything I'm showing you is a skill. Ideation, people say, well, I'm really good at brainstorming. Uh, it's actually a skill. It's actually very hard to Stop yourself from filtering your ideas and your thoughts. In ideation, you're just like, I want every crazy, stupid idea you can think of, but it's very hard for us to do it as adults. It's like being free, it's like being naked, and going, okay, let's go for it, okay? Ideation is that, that is like being naked in a way, okay? Prototyping is where you're taking ideas, and so what's interesting about the process um, is you generate lots of information. It's like you're doing research, but you're giving kids and yourself a methodology to, to capture lots of information, and then synthesize that information, create ideas, again, synthesize those ideas into prototypes. Physical embodiments of ideas, because now as you build stuff, you actually learn. And you're teaching this process of failing is okay, because you're doing it very quickly. So what happens over time when you do design thinking, one of the mindsets that's occurring is that you start, um, transforming what failing is, and failing is no longer failing. Failing means learning. And that becomes the epiphany moment when kids are doing this thing and they're, not, they're, like, they're not realizing, you know, you're failing. 
Because now it's all about learning. Right? So this is how it, and so from, so from prototyping, and again, we do prototyping very quickly. You know, what can you do in 10 minutes? Now later on, you'll do more and more elaborate and expensive and high resolution prototypes. But in the early part of when you're doing a new project, a lot of times people are trying to validate the idea. In design thinking, we start with trying to, dis we're in a discovery mode. So everything we're doing, even in prototyping, is not to validate that this is a good idea, but it helps us to continue a conversation about understanding who the user is and what their needs are. Because a lot of times, even in business, I can see with our clients, we get into it with our client. The client tells us for just 10 minutes what they think the problem is, and we're jumping to ideation. And I'm like, wow, it's kind of interesting because everyone in the room is an expert. Even the customer, but the problem is, what happens for customers a lot of times, your end users, is they live with a problem so long that they actually, the only thing they're telling you are the symptoms. And now you're starting to create solutions to the symptoms. And now when they're actually implementing and they're using it, they're going, you know, the problem's not going away because those are symptoms. So design thinking it creates a discipline to look back and kind of go, okay, Dig deeper, dig deeper on the empathy and define piece. So prototyping and all this, it just brings you back to doing more empathy and keep learning. Again, it creates this cycle of learning very rapidly. Last step is testing. So again, this is a this is another real great skill because how do you create a safe environment for your users to tell you the truth? So one of the things we tell people is when you do testing, you test with the idea that the ideas and the prototypes you've come up with are already wrong. Think about it. If you have the mindset of, man, this is the greatest idea in the world, and now I go to Steve and go, hey Steve, take a look at this prototype we're creating for you. How open am I to hearing what I, what I don't want to hear? What's going to happen is I'm going to listen to what I want to hear, and I'm only going to ask questions unconsciously that validate that this is a good idea. So when you test with the mindset that this is already wrong, I've let go of it. And now I can really hear. But that's kind of the mindset you want to have, right? For kids as, as well as ourselves. So this is the basically the five steps. I'm going through these things really quick because I want to get to this video before my laptop dies. But these are the mindsets. So what I showed you is the process of design thinking, which is kind of like a recipe. It's like here's a very powerful process. But these mindsets are equally as important. It's kind of like I some people, it's like doing, um, like I'm a master chef, and I give you guys all my secret recipe. And I go, okay guys, here's the recipe, try make it. And you go, hey, how come I'm, I'm following your recipe, but it's not coming out the same way? I think at some level, it has to do with mindset. This is super important as you do design thinking, because a lot of times what happens for people is when they're doing design thinking, they hit a wall. They go, ah, oh, we went through the process here, but we're still getting the same results. Guess why? You have to think about this. You have to look at these mindsets and practice these mindsets. Now, they will come over time as part of practicing this thing, but this becomes super important as, as you do design thinking. Okay. Now, one of the things that is not explicitly said in design thinking, but I think what happens in design thinking over time is you get better at it is you start to question the question. You start to question the question, <clears throat> okay? And so here's one question on the left is, let's make students want to learn. <clears throat> How do we make students want to learn? That's a question. Question the question. How do we make learning that's, that students want? It's something different, but it's huge, right? It's plain words, but... It's like you start learning, like, in order to do things differently, you have to start asking different questions. Bethan is a pro at this. It's like, how do you ask different questions? Otherwise, we keep getting the same answers. It's like, how do you, so you have to challenge, so the part of this, I think, it, it kind of slows you down and go, okay, think about it, like, is this the right question? I'm gonna show you a video. <clears throat> and this, to me, is empowerment, <clears throat> okay? We took, 109 high potential students. And what I mean by high potential, we literally challenged the kids to redesign their school experience. Okay? 
Think about it. We're asking these kids, we want you to redesign school. Like, what? Isn't that for the adults to figure out? But no, we want you guys to redesign school. And we will bring in, for you to interview, 20 students, your peers, who are already failing school or already have dropped out of school. These are the extreme users. In fact, all the kids were extreme users. But we brought in 20 other kids and says, you're going to interview these 20 kids. And we want you to, we want you to learn about these, these young people that are your peers. Not just what they like or don't like about school, but what is it like for, to be them? What is it to be like living in their shoes? And so we did this last year, and here's a short video. It's about seven minutes long. Today is really exciting. It's a Saturday morning out here in Aqua Bay. We have about 100 middle and high school students uh, helping us to redesign the school experience from a student's viewpoint. The idea is to help these students understand that they're users and they're designers of their education, of their lives, and their future. So we're gonna, you're going to help us redesign your school experience. So you're the experts in school, you're there, you live it every day. So you're going to help us, including working with the Department of Education and all of us, help you to redesign school. Do you think the grading system is fair? Oh, okay. Keep going, keep going, tell me some more. Does your teacher motivate you in school? Okay, that's good. Okay, go for it. Do you feel safe in school? Wow, that's, that's heavy. Okay. So, after school, or like any time, where did you see these people? A classroom. I don't like waiting outside too much. Outside of school, I like to go to the beach or like hiking. Or, you know, kind of like outdoor things. I don't like to stay inside. Oh, Miss uh, Alicia, she was like, she was a sweetheart. Uh, that class I attended almost every day. Because, I don't know, she just made learning really fun and she was like, she was a nice person to be around. It was like a safe learning environment for me. There were several kids here who were here to be interviewed. And so these 20, about 20 teams interviewed these students, um, some of which are struggling, some of them are very successful in school, to learn about finding solutions to allow these young people to see school as a very like, powerful experience where the greatest thing would be on Monday morning, they're, they're dying to get to school. I noticed from one of our interviewees, he said that there aren't a lot of support or services in school that we can go to. So I think that our school needs more support with teachers, students, the community, counselors. Take me through what, what, what you saw. In the first phase of this project, so in the first kind of following design, the design thinking step, so the first step was empathy. So what we had the students do was we had them brainstorm questions. So you heard me yeah, asking the kids, tell me, so I had them brain, I said, I want you guys to brainstorm like 100 questions. My teams, I want you to come up with every question you think you can think of that you would want to ask this, this student that you're going to interview. Because part of it was to teach the kids the power of questions, right? So, so kids would like, ask questions like, yeah, so what is it like, you know, what do you like about school? So we had the kids kind of test those ideas, like test those questions. And of course, you get information from it, but it's, it's much more limited. So we started, Asking kids, ask a much more user-centered question, which is like, what is it like to, what do you do after, you know, what is, what is it like to grow up in your family? What is it like after school for you, when you go home? It's because, and what is it like to live in the community that you're part of? So, so that these students start to hear much broader things than just, I like this or I don't like that about school. Because it's, it limits, in, in, in innovation, you'll find the innovation and insights and needs in stories. It's very hard for anybody to say, hey, tell me you know, 10 insightful things about your educational experience. It's very hard, right? So that's why we ask the students to learn how to ask good questions so that you can get good, um, rich information. So what is, is the question, the empathy section? Second step is, is really around the divine, which is the second step. And so again, this is about who is this person in front of you? Like, do you really understand who they are? And what are the needs that this person has? And again, they may not have explicitly, they're not probably telling you, I need, I need safety. 
I need to feel safe in school. There, a lot of times you're not seeing it, but in the story they're telling you, you'll hear, oh, they're afraid. They're afraid of getting bullied. They're afraid of this. They're afraid of their families or something. So that, so that you're teaching the kids to be like, like investigative reporters. They're, they're kind of going deeper. They're trying to synthesize, analyze what is being said to them. When again, the person is not going to just say, this is, what, this is who I am and what I'm about and what I need. Okay? Third step is around ideation. So the kids, we have 20 teams. So they, we ask them to generate all kinds of crazy ideas. I want to hear every idea you have. And then we taught them a process to filter those ideas. And again, I want you to know, this is all led by students. There was many times an adult at the table, and I had to actually tell the adults at the very beginning multiple times to stop. This is not for you. These kids are capable, and they're going to show you maneuvers and moves that are going to blow your mind. So just stand back, let, and we'll take the kids through it. And they did. <clears throat> okay, so these kids like killed it. So ideation, we have tons of ideas. We show them how to filter those ideas. And then we ask them to prototype ideas. So you saw and heard some of those ideas. And, and a lot of these ideas, we, as an adult, I don't think we would have come up with these ideas. Now, we may have if we had interviewed these students as well, had done the empathy work. Now, I, was, I didn't get a chance to look at your faces, but when that one team said, we want to pay kids for grades, I can tell you, in our session with all the adults, I could look at all the adult faces, and everybody went, what? What, what did they just say? Like, you want to get paid for grades? Right? But then, when you heard, right, what happens is a lot of the 20 kids, they come from, some cases, no families. They don't have a family. Or many of them come from single, mom, single moms who are working two to three jobs, and they barely make it every month. So a lot of the kids, to help the family survive, will actually drop out of school and go to work. And in fact, many of the students who are part of this, this day, as soon as we finish, they all have to run away to go to work. That's the reality. So when you hear this, the idea that came, the kids came up with, and based on the people they're interviewing, it totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. Now, will we do that? I don't know, but you know what? We're getting to see a point of view that we may not have ever seen before. Okay? The other kid was about open book tests. And, and what was really interesting, because I said, why is having an open book test? He goes, well, because I can't memorize. And I said, well, and I can't regurgitate these answers. And so I asked him, so how does that make you feel? And he says, it makes us feel stupid. Like right off the bat, it's like, it just makes us feel stupid. Like, so we're not whatever we can memorize. But in reality, right, there's been studies they've done, right? Three months, kids, they take, have a kids take a test, they get A's. Three months later, when they test them again, they're all getting F's. So what was that about? Memorization? Well, guess what? They failed that too. And they can't remember anything. So what did we really learn? Right? So this is just the interesting part. And but the but the collateral damage, the real damage, is these students feel stupid right off the bat. So it was interesting to hear this, right? And then the last so prototype so actually they got to test these ideas. Again, we told them, pick the mindset of this is already a bad idea. It's already it's, it's probably not gonna work. Let it go. So you can hear the feedback from your users. <clears throat> There's a website called Design Thinking for Educators. And I have a resource thing at the end where all the information is. But these are three example stories that are on the website. These are design challenges. So one is redesigning the classroom. Another one is redesigning the school, which is kind of what we did last year in a real world situation. Okay, And then this last one is actually the castle complex redesign. So the third story on this website is actually a Hawaii story that we were a part of. We work with the Castle team and all that, and I'm actually a Castle grad, so I can talk good and bad about my alumni school. But we, we, it's a fantastic school, but they were struggling, and we're in a restructuring mode. And when a school struggles, it, 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 it goes beyond the walls of the school, the boundaries of the school. So we have to go out to the community and businesses and actually interview and do <coughs> empathy sessions uh, to understand what was going on in the community. Prototyping exercise. So. <coughs> Um, we're going to do, oh, you got? Oh, you got? Okay, so, so Steve's going to help me, do, we're going to do a prototyping exercise. We're going to pass around some, I think there's tin foils on all of your tables. So everyone should grab a sheet of tin foil. Okay. Grab a tin foil, everyone grab a piece of tin foil. 
Steve is coming around with With, and also, um, he's, he has a piece of paper for each table. And don't look at that piece of paper. Not yet. Don't look at the piece of paper yet. Don't look at the piece of paper yet. That piece of paper has an animal on it. But don't look at it yet. Because we're going to only give you 60 seconds to do this exercise. 60 seconds. This is a prototyping exercise. Okay, so don't look at the, don't do anything with the piece, with the tin foil. By the way, that tin foil is your tin foil. You can do whatever you want with that tin foil. Okay, you can tear it up. You can do whatever you want. But you're going to build in a second here. You're going to build the animal that's on that piece of paper. Okay, and you're only going to have 60 seconds to do it. Okay. So you, you'll, you'll have to show that animal to the rest of your team, okay? So, okay, I need a... Yeah. Time scene? Okay, so everyone got the instructions. Okay. That tin foil, you're going to build, product build an an the animal that's on that piece of paper, and you only have 60 seconds. Everybody on your team, build that animal that's on that piece of paper. And that tin foil, you can do whatever you want with it, okay? So ready? Oh. But your animal is unique to your table, but you know, so you guys can talk about it without letting the other table know what yours is. Okay. Yeah. Get it? Oh, I didn't get that. I'm oh, sorry. So we don't understand yeah, whether we're working collaboratively on one animal. No. So, so by the way, you are to do this exercise individually. So I, I don't want you to make like a joint animal. Okay. That's good. I want you to do it individually. There's going to be a point to this. There is a point to this. So you use your paper. You make a version of that animal that's for your team. Okay? You guys ready? 60 seconds. Steve, you got the time? Ready? Ready, set, go. Build. Get the piece of paper and start building that animal. your team's animals. Look for the part of the animal where you, each person's animal go, where is the like really interesting part of each person's design? Like, what is the part that you like? Look at each other and go, oh, I like that part. I like that part. What do you like about each person's animal? I like that shape. Yeah. <laughs>
that and it, then design thinking allows you to harness that in everyone in the team because what happens is, sometimes is we start with group thinking too early and that's what we get we get this yuck we get this yuck right it's like and everyone's fighting look my idea is better than your idea my kung fu is better than yours it doesn't work but this is a way a very disciplined process to make that happen okay that's first part so here's Here's part of why we, we do design. He does, I swear to God, we do that work. And so people ask me, so Ian, what kind of jobs are you gonna create for us? And I'm like, I don't, that's, that's a hard question for me to answer because I don't even know what, we're on the cutting edge, so we don't even know where the edge is. Like, it changes every year. So for me to tell you, teach your students this, or specific technology or specific thing, is very dangerous. But if you teach them a mindset, a process, that will live forever with them. They will be able to adapt and adjust to a world that changes so quickly, there is no company in the world I know that's ahead of the curve. There is no company like that. The world changes so quickly, the question is how quickly can you change as it changes? Design thinking and these kinds of mindsets allow you to do it, I believe. So this is the question. So, it's so, so that's why I was going, I don't know if that's the, the question. I think the question is more something like this. How might we empower students with superpowers to create versus wait for a life in career? So I'm actually challenging Kitayashi and others is challenge the kids to actually start a company. Give them skills and experiences so they could create their own jobs while they're still in high school. And you know what, even if they don't do it, the mindset and what they'll learn from it will make them so much more valuable and make their learning so much more relevant. But challenge them to be way more. Again, you think about it, we took what people would say about the throwaway kids and asked them to redesign education, redesign their school, and they blew our minds. Those are the kids who are gonna create the most radical new companies for our economy. I think it's actually those kids. If given the opportunity and the and skills and experiences and things like design thinking and entrepreneurial skills and coding and c communication skills and digital media skills, like they're gonna transform our economy, not us in ocean. They're gonna do it if we give them these skills and experiences. This is the other statistic that got me really scared. 10 years ago, is when, almost 10 years ago is when I met Keith Hayashi accidentally. We were at a CTE conference. A guy from Harvard came in, I don't think it was Tony, I don't think it was Tony, but I don't remember anything that guy said, but this is the one thing that I remember. And it was like frightening. I thought, wow, so what happens for the other 75% of kids? Don't they get a chance? Like, what's, the, what's, their up, what's their upside to all of this, right? And even for the 25%, there's no guarantees there either. In fact, I was telling my friend, when I graduated from college, and my professor, who was my mentor, it was like 30 years ago, he was like, he was like ahead of the curve. Because when we graduated, the day before we graduated, he got in front of the room and he says, you know, you guys all graduated. You work really hard and you're gonna get this degree. And all of you think that the thing you're getting is a ticket. You're getting a ticket to a better life. You're gonna get out of Hawaii. You're gonna get some respect. And he says, you know what you got? You got a receipt. I don't wanna know. What do you mean it's a receipt? I thought this was like my ticket to like out of, out of the life, whatever, right? So it's a receipt. And that's what it is. It still is a receipt. It's what you do with all that learning and education, but also how you learn to learn, right? That's the biggest thing I learned from college was I learned how to learn. That's what I got from college. And ever since then, I tell the kids coming out, college was 1% of what you're going to need to know. Everything else is after, 90 is everything after that. So if you don't love learning, you're not going to love working at Ocean because every day is like another learning experience. How do you create students that love learning? Right? This is what really got me scared. I went, yeah, we got to do something. And so the inspiration, that, so that video you saw was actually the second time we did a very large exercise with 
lots of just students, just students. Normally when we do design thinking, we do it with educators and principals and all of that and adults, and there's students there. But last year was the second time we did an all student boot camp. And we took kids who people would say, you know, people say, oh, you should work with the high performance kids, the best kids. We say, no, I've, I, because I've seen it too many times where actually the kids people say are the worst kids. Actually in design thinking, are like the best kids. Because, you know, there's this saying, right? You see this quote? Have you seen this quote by Albert Einstein? Every time kids come to the office and I do a presentation, I show them, saying, I say, I want you to read this five times. I want you to burn this in your brain. I want you to burn this in your brain. Your job is to figure out, are you a fish? Or are you a frog? Are you a bear? Or a lion? And then your job is to put yourself in the right environment. See, but right now, like the environment, these kids I've just mentioned, school is, is like a tree. And these kids are like fish. So they're trying to be a fish, trying to climb a tree. And so no matter if, whatever happens for them in school, they always feel like failures. They just feel like failures all the time. No matter what they do, they feel like failures. But when we take them in design, through, through design thinking, design thinking is like water. And they're fish. And when we put them into that environment, it's like... The game's on. Like these kids who people say are throwaways are the ones you want to like help. Like they're they're helping us. They're creating value. So again, they're kind of like the fish in water. So design thinking, in my opinion, is like a super. You know, you, you think about Superman and, and, and um, you know, Superman on Krypton is a normal guy, right? He's a normal guy. But on Earth, he has superpowers. He put himself in an environment where he has a superpower. So I tell kids, you all have gifts. Your thing is to figure out, if you're a fish, you better put yourself in water, not a tree. But design thinking does that. I think it unleashes these things for students. Now, the other superpowers that I was talking about that about it is like, like, like communication skills, coding skills, entrepreneurship skills. Like, what are the skills you would want to give your own kids if they decided not to go to college, but the skills and experiences so they could actually create their own life. They could create a career. They could create the next great company for them. Exercise. We're going to do an exercise. You want to hold it? You want to do it? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll take it. Okay. Um, can we hear me okay? All right, so for this exercise, in your uh, blue folder, take out a blank sheet of paper, one blank sheet of lined paper. You can use the back of another sheet of paper. It doesn't matter as long as it's a blank piece of paper. That's all you need. All you're going to do, you're going to have it sideways, the landscape, and you're going to draw six circles across the top and then five down. So six circles in a, in a row, and then, and then a column, and you're gonna make 30 circles. So six cross top, five down, 30 circles. Just draw them really quickly, just 30 circles, they don't gotta be crazy, just 30 circles. Okay. All right. So now that you now that you've drawn the thirty circles, <coughs> what I want you to do. One minute. Yeah. Okay. Again, one minute. Sorry, just get a minute. Um, you're going to create as many things as you can out of those circles. So. Whatever you want to make those circles into, go crazy. Okay? Just Questions? So, like an example would be a smiley face. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You, yeah. Create pictures with that. Yes. Create, yeah. Use those circles to create.
things that I would recognize. Like if you show the 30 circles to somebody, they would go, oh, I, I know what that is. Right. Turn the 30 circles to a recognizable object. Can you add on to Seconds left. That, 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 was, that was me when I did it. And then, when I saw examples of other people's, I was like, wait a minute, you can connect them? You can make like a pair of eyes? Yeah. You can make a whole thing together, make a centipede? Like just, just put a circle around it and make a bunch of legs? No fair. Right? You can make, uh, you know, three boxes of eggs? You know, you can use the whole thing to be, you know, wh whatever. So, um, there's lots and lots of other examples. You can make a bunch of planets all, you know, orbiting around the sun. You know, uh, limitless, right? So this exercise is designed to break the, out of the mindset, you know, that, that I have of, well, you, there, there's a prescribed way to do this, there's a right way to do this, and I want to do it the right way. There isn't a right way. There is just creativity, and that's it. So, so this is designed to, to kind of burn that into you in a very short, short exercise. So if you go to the design thinking class, uh, you do the boot camp, you'll do a lot more of these type of exercises that, that will help you to flex those, those muscles that are dormant sometimes. And that, and that re really, we, we, don't, we don't exercise. So this is just a little, little glimpse of that. So, so did, anybody actually, did anybody actually get 30? Got 30, awesome. Anybody got like, oh, awesome. 20? Anybody got like nice. 20 or more? Nice. Perfect. Anybody got like 10 or more? Okay, good. What do you know, I mean, did anybody um, notice a feeling at some point of like feeling stuck? Did, did anybody have like a moment where they had a, like a breakout moment where they went, oh, if I did this, I could do more. Yeah, like coming outside or like Steve said, like connecting circles. Did anybody do patterns? Okay, yeah. Like, this is a very interesting exercise to see how we, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise and also a way of how to reframe, right? How we look at these circles. Because I actually set you up. When I said a smiley face in a circle, I kind of set you up, right? But I want you to notice, we set ourselves up all the time and how we think about education like education is in this circle or business we're in this circle we actually from the very get go set ourselves up to make it very difficult to do things differently right? this is a very powerful if you really think about it you could play with this and it's very powerful because when you start to reframe this thing from being that's the constraints and the hardest part you have, of course, is because you live in education. Right? You have constraints upon constraints upon constraints. But your your opportunity is like how to think of it like in a in a reframed way. 
I think my laptop is <coughs> or usage projector is fine uh, on the last we'll see here. Let me um, without the slides tell you what <coughs> you would have seen. Um, so part of it is why is why did, why is ocean why did ocean even involved in this? We're not in education. We're a high tech company. Like I said, we're kind of like James Bond lab of crazy engineers and scientists inventing really radical things. And so, but I could see where um, if we were an eight cylinder car, I felt like we were firing on three cylinders. So even as innovative as we were, um, I felt like we're just firing on three cylinders. But we had the potential of being an eight cylinder car, as an analogy. I think in many ways, hopefully you feel the same way about your school and what you're doing. It's like you have so much more potential but like something is holding you back, or something to not make it. And for me, it was around how do we, um, how do we get people who are innovative? So here's the interesting part: people who are really good at what they're doing. When you ask them how are they doing it, many times they can't actually tell you how they're doing it. And that's really hard then to like have other people learn it. And so. Back in 2008, my boss passed around an article, it was actually later, maybe in 2009, he passed around an article from Harvard Business Review about this thing called design thinking. And when I read it, it was kind of like, you know, you have those epiphany moments where the light goes off, and I was like, whoa. These guys at Stanford and at IDEO had taken the process, had, had basically created a process to teach outside the box thinking. You know when somebody says, think outside the box? They would tell me, hey, like, think outside the box. I'm like, I get sick of it. I go, okay, well, show me how to do it. Show me how to do it. Tell me how to do it, and I will please, I will do it. That is what we need for everybody in the company. That's how we're gonna be an eight-cylinder car, realizing our full potential. But we all have to be doing it. And so what happens in design thinking is it creates a common language, a common process, that's human-centered, that's focused on the user. In your case, if you're a teacher, it's about being student-centered. It creates a discipline and a way to do that. But more powerfully what it does is now when you work with your teachers, your principals, but you work with companies and people outside of your organization, if we both know design thinking, we have a way to work together. The problem I notice is we actually have different, we call things different things, but we're talking about the same thing, but we're, we're fighting because we, we have a different language. Say, you, have, you speak Chinese, I speak Japanese, you speak Filipino, and we're talking about the same thing, but we cannot understand each other. So when people learn design thinking, what it does, it creates a common language and a common process that's human-centered. And, it, and, it, and actually more powerfully, what happens over time is you start to change the culture. The thing that I, I, was, I saw with Tony's presentation and the, the film Most Likely to Succeed, what they have created there is a, is a culture of experimentation. They're willing to try. Now, if you don't have that culture, I don't care what you do, you're gonna kill it. <clears throat> Even as great as the idea, it will die in the wrong culture. So unless you start to transform the culture, and how you transform the culture is actually, I believe, one way is through design thinking. Because now, we're all using the same creative innovation process. And as we transform as individuals, and as we transform as teams in the way we think, we naturally transform the culture. You can't just go, change the culture. The culture will change over time because individuals feel empowered. They feel like, oh, failing is not failing. Failing really means learning if we do it very rapidly and quickly. But we're doing it as a team. It's like your, your thing, right? People would say, oh, that's a failure. Based on what? Right, but we, see this is the other part too, the metrics we use kind of set us up as well. But in your exercise with the, with the dragon, they were all brilliant, and together, it becomes even more brilliant ideas. But you, right there, was a, you created a culture of experimentation. Nothing was wrong. In fact, it allowed you to create greater potential as a result of it. Okay, so, anyway, so this slide, my, my laptop's still going, but I don't know, my slide deck is all messed up. But anyway, so that's, I think we're just about time. So any questions? I, I, sorry, we can't show you more stuff, but yes? Um, look, I love it. I, I look at it in my mind. I'm a researcher, so I look at it as a research process, basically. Yes. Um, the part that I'm having a little difficulty with is the prototype, and the other part of it is um, as a 
teacher in the classroom on a daily basis. This is not applicable. It's applicable as research project, but is there a way to make it applicable on a more common level rather than a large research project? Yeah, so what we've seen with um, in the classroom, people will use uh, different parts of the process um, in their teaching. Mm -hmm. So maybe you know they're 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 asking the teacher is asking, okay, I want you to do a project around World War II, mm -hmm. right? But now what happens is they all get together and they start to brainstorm ideas or questions they have around World War II. So they start, they start simply as, what questions do the kids have? Do you guys we have about World War II? And so that's, and, but that's using like a brainstorming technique. And then that leads to, okay, what is, what are some of the topic areas? And essentially we, you can use different elements of the process to help with your teaching and make it experiential. And then for the more, um, as kids learn more of the process, what, what really happens is we create design challenges. We say, as a, maybe as a classroom, let's work on a problem that, that touches all of us. So maybe it's around homelessness. Mm -hmm. So maybe the challenge is homelessness, but then you're maybe a teaching a particular subject. And so now you're using a subject like that in a process to engage the students as you inject into it the learning that you're trying to, which may be history or math or science or some element of it. But you're using that to kind of hold their attention. But again, what's interesting is when you do that process, the kids will actually drive the learning. You as a teacher, it becomes what I think Tony's talking about. You become the performance coach and the safety coach. Safety in a sense is you, you creating a safe environment for them to try stuff. And I feel like I'm doing it wrong. What happens a lot of times is the kids are very compliant. They're constantly asking you, am I doing it right? Do you want it in blue? Should I do this? Should I do that? Like, they're just so, this kind of helps you help them. Like go open forward, up. open up, and make dragons, and I feel like I'm doing it wrong. I bet you've met kids, depending on what they're, they, they'd be like, I'm doing this right? Am I doing this right, Mr. Kitajima? I was like, what? Right? And you had a question about that. Oh, you know, you know, sorry. Oh, uh, I was just wondering about that article that you mentioned about thinking outside the box. Yeah, so the, actually, the slide deck I'll provide, it's the, there's an article, it was a 2008 article and it was Harvard Business Review about design thinking. There's been, um, just recently, I think this month, we had an article about design thinking and how it's become a buzzword in education. That's a topic, it's something like how design thinking has become a buzzword in education and it's by the Atlantic. It's a very, very good article. I highly recommend you read that. There's a bunch of resource materials, again, design thinking for educators. We have a boot camp, boot camp coming up in July of this year. It's, it's our annual, it's our seventh annual boot camp for educators, but now it's become industry, industry joins us as well. Please go to eventbrite.com, eventbrite.com, and search for Design Thinking Hawaii. And there is a, there is a, a sign up, not to come to the boot camp, it's more to show if you're interested in bringing a team to the boot camp. Because we're trying to measure how many people want to come so we can plan for it and also help to raise monies so people can come to the boot camp. So your interest, if you're interested, please kind of give us an indication by going to eventbrite.com, looking for Design Thinking Hawaii, look for the seventh annual boot camp, and register a team or two teams or three teams and let us know if you're interested. And that helps us to kind of gauge how much resources we need to, to bring. And we're out of time.